in the next, I guess, 45 times four uh, uh, minutes, we're going to prove, uh, I'm going to show you the proof of the prime number theorem. And essentially, with just the semester we saw in complex analysis, you can follow every single detail. There's a place in which I use integration on distributions, but it will sort of be clear. Maybe that would need to be justified just slightly more, but probably you've seen this in another analysis class also. Okay, so 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 let's let's say what the what the theorem is. Let me let me write it. So okay. So the prime number theorem says the following. Okay, so let me define for a function, right? So pi of x. Right? This is a function. It just counts is the number of primes p that are smaller or equal than x. Okay, so the idea is we want to count how many primes are there that are smaller than, than the number x, right? The question is, you know, how many primes how many prime numbers are there in, right, in the numbers from 1 to x? Right? This is a you know, fundamental question in, in number theory and a fundamental question about integers. Right? Prime numbers are you know, are sort of the building blocks of, of numbers, right? I'm sure everyone knows what a prime number is, it's just an integer that is only divisible by itself and by one. Okay, and if you, you know, if you've ever looked at primes, it's sort of clear that their density is a lot higher for small numbers than for large numbers, right? If you look at the numbers from one to 10, there feels like there's a lot of, from two to 10, that there's a lot, the, the density of primes is much bigger than if you look at the, at the density of primes for, from say 10 to 100, right? And so this is measuring exactly what, uh, right? exactly what, um, exactly what this, this density is, okay? And so the, what, what the prime number theorem says, right? says this amazing thing that the number of primes smaller or equal than x grows exactly like x to the log x. Okay. That, the, that the density of primes is always exactly one over log of the number. Okay, this is sort of, and, and this is not just up to constants, right? What I mean here is if, when I say that f of x grows like g of x, what I mean is the limit as x goes to infinity, of say f of x over g of x is one. Okay, so it grows exactly like this. And so I will show you the proof of this in the next, I guess, three hours or something like this. Okay. So this was first observed. I mean, people have been looking at primes for you know millennia now, but this was first uh, observed, as far as we know, by uh, Maybe like, so people like Gauss and I think uh, Legendre maybe, I oh, hope I get this right, Legendre. Right, so somewhere like uh, very late, something like the late 1700s and, uh, and early 1800s, they sort of independently, I think Gauss had done some calculations, but uh, Sort of didn't communicate to anyone. Then Legendre wrote a uh, wrote a, a paper, or a monograph in which he talks about this, and then Gauss pointed out that he had done some of these calculations before. But all this stuff, like they they they've realized this or they've seen this. So maybe one in seventeen ninety something, and then eighteen oh something. Okay. Ah, someone asked if this is in Alfred's. This is not in Alfred's. Okay, I wrote on the. Um, yeah, so I wrote on the, on the forum and on the Zoom link. What I will follow is, uh, is this very nice paper by, uh, no, I don't remember the name, Zagier, maybe? Let's see. Yeah, by, by Zagier. He writes in the, in the occasion of the, 
of the 100th anniversary of the prime number theorem, he wrote this very nice paper in the, in the American Mathematical Monthly where he shows a very, uh, sort of a short proof of this that's, that's an argument by Newman. And so I sent the link on the, um, the reference on the, on the forum and on the Zoom, and the paper is actually available in the author's webpage. So if you just Google, you'll also find it. But I sent sort of the stable, the stable link to. Hey, I mean, the, 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 I haven't even said when this was proved, but the first proofs were, were uh, yeah, more complicated. But yeah, this is not, this is not in Alfred's. Okay, any, any more questions? No, all right. So, so, so basically here they conjectured it, right? So basically they conjecture this to be the case. They conjecture the prime number theorem, and they conjecture this by just you know building tables. I mean, just imagine, right? They literally build build tables of how many primes there were, and then saw that this behaved a lot like x over log x. I mean, just think about this for a second, right? It's not like they were using computers, right? And and to in order to see log x, you need to go pretty big. Right, because if you have, if x is very small, log x looks completely like a constant. Like, how would you see this uh, this behavior? Right, it's sort of uh, incredible that that uh, right Gauss and Legendre son were able to conjecture this. Like, imagine the size of tables of primes they had to build by hand. <laughs> okay, so in uh, okay, so this was uh, this was a conjecture. I mean. A very fundamental conjecture, right? There's absolutely no reason a priori to believe that something like this even exists, right? That you can understand its limit or that the limit is even nicely defined or let alone that it looks like such a nice function, right? So the first, I mean, there were, I mean, people understood it more and more and so on, but one thing I want to mention is Chebyshev. So 50 years after roughly, so Chebyshev, uh, I think mid uh, mid 1800s. So we're talking somewhere around eight, 19, uh, 1850, somewhere around there, right? So he showed uh, upper and lower bounds of that size. So basically, he showed that there exists some constants, you know, c1, c2, such that you know, phi of x. Uh, is smaller or equal than a constant times x log x and smaller or equal than another constant. You should think of this for x large enough, for x large enough. Right, I mean, you can get it because, you know, if this, if this inequality is not valid for 10 because of uh, small x phenomena, that's not so interesting. But you could also just make it true by picking other constants, but think of this as for... Uh, Right, for x big enough. Okay, so Chebyshev shows that uh, indeed this is the right growth, right? The right growth for this is uh, x over log x, just maybe up to constant. And I think he even got to, I would now have to check, but I think he even got to something like 0 0.9 something and 1.1 something. It was quite close. So then in, in the very end of the 1800s, so late, yeah, somewhere like late 1800s, so you know, around a bit over 100 years ago, and in fact, the, the paper that I'm following is, was written in the, in the 100th anniversary, right? So this was proved, uh, PNT was proved by, uh, by two people, so by Adamar independently, by Adamard, we saw a few things of Adamard already, and uh, someone called uh, um, De Valle Poisson. Poisson. Okay. And, uh, and so they proved this, and this was a major, a major breakthrough, right, around 100 years ago. And the proofs were based on complex analysis. Okay. And th this is what's incredible. I mean, again, th think about it a bit, right? 
why would a, you know why would such a statement have anything to do with with complex analysis? Like, there's no complex numbers anywhere. There's no analytic functions. There's nothing. There's no integration. There's none of the objects that we've seen. Okay. Yeah, I would I would say that yeah, all the objects that we've studied so far in the class, there is none of them on the board, right? And somehow we're going to prove this theorem using uh, using complex analysis. Right, and it's just one of these amazing stories of how you know, an area of math interlaces with another one in a surprising way. Okay, so let's start. Maybe before I do any, uh, any complex analysis, let's do just a little bit of, of number theory. Okay. How do we, so let's try to prove at least part of Chebyshev's uh, bound. Okay, so let's try to prove this bound here. So there's two things. Let, let's try to do first, without being very precise on exactly the prime number theorem, let's just try to understand how is it that Chebyshev proved this, right? How can we argue that there is, there needs to be, uh, you know, there's two things that gets argued here. There is at least a certain amount of primes and there can be no more than a certain amount, right? So I'm going to do the simplest of the two with the argument, which is this one just to, to show the kind of, the kind of ideas that, that go into this. And, and then a more refined argument can get also the lower bound, but I won't do it, right? I mean, one, uh, one very famous uh, lower bound, right? Which is, and I'm sure all of you have seen many, many times, is just showing that this function actually uh, goes to infinity, right? That there's infinitely many primes, right? And this, this, this is uh, you know, much, much older. And there's this really nice argument that if they were finite, you would just take their product at one and then uh, this couldn't be divisible by any of them. So there must be some other prime that you haven't, uh, that you haven't considered, right? So just showing that, you know, showing that pi x goes to infinity, it's, I guess, trivial now because it's such a, you know, we're so used to this very nice argument, but it's a really, really beautiful Simple mathematical argument. Okay, so let me show you. Let me show you the proof of, of this. Okay. Uh, okay. So, in in the way I'm presenting, I'm deviating slightly from the paper that I refer that I uh, referenced, but the paper is organized by proving say five or six lemmas, and so I'll still use the numbering of the paper so that you can easily go back and read it. And so this means that the numbering that I'll use not always will be the, the, right, uh, yeah, the right one, but it's okay. So, okay, so let me erase and let's prove, uh, let's prove this. Where's my... Okay, so the proof is, you know I, know, I don't know how much number theory all of you have seen, or some of you, but uh, the, the proof reminds a lot this Bertrand's postulate, right? So the idea, what, what's the idea of the proof? The idea is if I take, if I take the binomial coefficient 2n to the n, right, there's this very nice theorem in number theory that there's always a prime between a number and its double. Right, and uses a sort of, uh, I mean, similar kind of trick, right? But the idea here is if I take, right, if I take this binomial coefficient, right, then, you know, every prime, it's not so hard to see that every prime between n and 2n needs to, to divide this, 
right? Because what is this? This is 2n factorial, so the product of all the numbers up to 2n, divided by n factorial twice. So if there is a prime that is bigger than n but smaller than 2n, for sure it needs to be in the numerator of this and cannot be in the denominator, right? So this needs to be divisible by every prime between n and 2n. So in particular, this needs to be big or equal than any prime. So, okay, maybe I should say, I'm not gonna write P prime every time. Every time I have P, P is always a prime. Okay, so P is always a prime. Okay, so whenever I write product over P, I always mean prime. Okay? I can... Uh, Okay. So this number needs to be divisible by every prime bigger than n and smaller or equal than 2n. So in particular, we must have this. Right? Does everyone agree with that? If anything is not clear, please, uh, yeah, please interrupt. Okay. So, so this is already a way of upper bounding the number of primes. I mean, I need to work a little harder, but just by this formula, if I can upper bound the size of this, Right? Then there can't be they there can't be that many primes. I mean they're, they're sort of they can't, right? I because their product needs to be small than something, I already found a way of approbounding them. Right? But now it's not how so I have to do two things, right? I have to compare this with the uh, with the number of uh, with the number of primes, right? How do I do this? Well, all of them are bigger than n, so I can just do this n to the power of how many there are, right? And what is this? This is just pi of 2n minus pi of n, right? If, if I replace p by n, I get only something smaller, right? And how many do I have? I have how many primes are there between 2n and n? Is the number of primes up to 2n minus the number of primes up to n, okay? Now I have to lower bound this. Okay, how can I lower bound that? Well, this is 2n choose n, right? So if I have 2n things, it's the way of choosing n, a subset of n out of them, right? This is for sure smaller than just the number of, of ways of choosing subsets of 2n things, right? If I have 2n balls and I just choose n, n a subset of any size, how many ways are there of doing that? There's two to the two to the n, right? For each ball, I decide if it's in the set or not. While here, I'm forcing the subsets to be of size n, so certainly I have a smaller number. Okay, so now I have a, right. I have an equation, right? In particular, I have you know I can just take I bounded pi of two n with respect to pi n and something else, right? And now basically I have everything. Right, because I mean, what's what's going on here? Okay, let, let's first before we do the calculation. Right, I have n to some power. Right, this needs to be smaller than two to the n. So certainly, what's here needs to be smaller than something like n over log n. Right, and so we're done. I just need to make this a little more precise, but essentially we're done. So we just take logarithms base two everywhere, and so what we get? So taking logarithms base two, we get two n. Uh, big or equal than, uh, so I get uh, log base two. When when the logs when I don't put any base of the log, I always mean uh, you know the, the the natural logarithm. Okay. So you know I can now rewrite this the other way around. So I get that pi to n. And this pi n of oh, smaller equal than, and now I get uh, yeah two n over log two n. Okay, and now I just have to recur, right? I just have to write pi n, and have to do the same thing for pi n, pi n over two, and so on. Okay, so. So basically, I mean, let's take n to be a power of two, not to worry too much. And then we have uh, easily that, uh, you know, pi of two n 
will be smaller or equal if we just do this a bunch of times, something like 2n log base 2 of n plus n log base 2 n over 2 plus n over 2. All right. Uh, this right, yeah. It's two of n over four, so one plus I do this say k times, so I get two k minus one over log it's two of n to the two k. Okay, and so I can just pick. Right, I can just pick, say, k, let me pick so that, uh, I don't know, k, so that 2 to the k, and there's many ways of doing this now, but let's pick so that 2 to the k is like square root of n. All right, so if I do this, what do I have? I have that pi 2 to the n is small or equal than uh, 2 n log 2 of n. Plus here, basically, I get two root n and um, over log of, right, log of square root n. But log of square root n is just log n over two, right? Plus uh, now pi of, so I have pi of square root n. Okay, I mean, it's kind of obvious now. Ah, did I make a... Did I move the two inside somewhere? Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, everything else is okay? Yeah. Okay, I mean, it's clear, right? Now it's completely obvious. I just have to do a bit of analysis, right? But, like, this is just a, a geometric series, so of course this is going to be of size n over log n. Right, the, the only issue why I can't do immediately the geometric series is by, you know, by the time this ended, the log sort of disappeared because you have n over n. But if I cut at say square root n, then this thing for sure, right, is smaller or equal than square root n, right? And this, right, is smaller or equal than if I just pick the smallest of the denominators, which is one half log base two of n. And I'm not claiming that this gives the best, the best constant, right? Smaller two n plus n plus, sorry, n over two plus all the way, all the way to one even, right? Because I'm only getting, you know, I can even continue the sum, I can only get more terms plus square root n, right? But now this, right? Now this is just a geometric series, so this is smaller or equal than, okay, let's do one over one half log base two of n. And now what do I get here? I get something like smaller or equal than four n, right? Uh, plus square root n. And so this is smaller or equal than eight n over log base two of n. Okay, and I have what I want, right? I, uh, right, and so I get that pi, pi of 2n, small or equal than, right, so what we got here, 8n log base 2, but b log base 2 is just a constant away from, log, from the natural log, so it doesn't matter, plus root n, right, and so I get what I want. Okay, so we have already that, maybe let's write what, what we have up there. We have already that uh, no, it's upper, that this is the right scale for the upper bound. Okay, and the idea and, and to get the lower bound, you can actually get it also by using by using this binomial, but it requires a bit more of a refined analysis. Okay. Okay. So, right. If you remember this Petrans uh, postulate. Right, it says that it uses this to, to argue that there must exist a prime between n and 2n. Basically, we can refine that a bit more. Okay, is this clear? Yeah, okay.
Okay, so we have, let's say what we proved already. We proved that pi x is O of x over log x. Right, I don't know if you're familiar with the, with the big O notation. I think you've taken some algorithms class. By big O, what is meant is right, f of x is big O of g of x. If, um, if there exists a constant such that f of x is smaller or equal than constant times g of x. Okay, and Chevichev also proves that uh, that this is big O of pi of x, but uh, but yeah, we'll we'll get there. Well, we won't show that. I'll show directly that it's exactly x over log x. Okay, so the way to do this actually, we're going to prove we're going to prove exactly right. So we're going to prove exactly that pi of x is x over log x. Now we're gonna do this via another function. Turns out that this is nicer to understand. We're gonna do this via the function uh, new x. We're gonna show that this is equal to, okay, so, so I'm gonna define a function, so the sum over all primes smaller than x. Remember, when I write this, I always mean p prime, always. Okay. And this is smaller or equal than, it is this log p. Right, and because log is such a concave function, right, it's much bigger, it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it, it grows very slowly in the end. Uh, this is roughly the same as just counting the number of primes to x and multiplying by log x. Right, and so we'll show, so the goal, okay. So today I'm probably not gonna get into any complex analysis, but uh, I'll set up everything so that then we can start after. Okay. Okay, so So we will show I think this had a number in the paper but I, I don't remember but okay. We will show that this function grows as fast as x which is sort of the same, right? Because if, you, if this was the sum uh, p of all primes and log x, right, then this growing as x would be the, exactly the same thing as pi x growing as x over log x. And uh, let me just check if, if this is a number so that when you go back and see, you can, uh, yeah. So this, in, in the paper, this is called uh, um, assertion six. Okay. So before, and, and this will do with complex analysis, but before we get to the complex analysis, I want to show to you that, uh, let me just see if I can see the chat back. Uh, so before, you know, before we prove, uh, before we prove this, which I'm, I'm using this weird numbering, six, is so that it makes it easier for you to go read the paper if you want to. So the numbering will show up really weird here, but it'll make it much easier if you want to read later. But we'll show first that uh, you know, this implies the prime number theorem, because that has no complex analysis, and it's sort of almost trivial. Okay, so, okay, so first of all, clearly we have, right, so, so we'll show Okay, proof. Okay, it's, it's, it's really very easy, right? So this is the sum, all primes smaller or equal than x 
of log of p, right? This is for sure smaller or equal than the sum over all primes smaller or equal than x if I replace log p by log x, right? Log x is bigger than log p. And then this is just the same as pi of x log x. Okay. So in particular, we have immediately that uh, pi x is bigger or equal than this. Okay. Now I have to show the other side, but the other side is also easy, right? So take, let epsilon bigger than zero. Think of it as small as we always do for, for epsilon, right? I have that, you know, Vx is big or equal than the sum, right? So it's this sum, what's the idea? Is if I do things up to, if I, instead of going, right? Most of, most, almost everything is happening close to x in the multiplicative scale. So I'm just gonna take the sum just over p being between x to the one minus epsilon and x, right? And for sure that sum is smaller. Right, because I'm not going all the way down. Okay, but now in, uh, you know, log p is always bigger or equal than log of x to the one minus epsilon. Log of x to the one minus epsilon. Right? Okay, so far so good. But now what is this equal to? Okay, this is equal to, well, one minus epsilon. So how many primes? First, the summon shows up h of x minus, or h not, sorry, ugh, pi of x minus pi of x to the one minus epsilon, right? This times log times one minus epsilon, right? Because in the log, times log x. Okay, but now we're done, right? Because, okay, let's just rewrite this slightly different. So this is equal to one minus epsilon, right? Pi of x, say log x, pi of x, minus a term, right? This term is bounded like pi of x, pi of x to the one minus epsilon, there's less primes than numbers. Right? And so this term is bounded by, okay, let me just make sure that you can still read well. Let me erase this better. Oh. Okay, I'll, I'll just redo this part. I mean, so far we're just doing elementary, uh, like, Elementary calculations, right? Nothing really interesting yet. Uh, I should do this just to make sure that it's okay. Minus a term that's bounded by pi x to the one minus epsilon times this times that, right? But in particular is bounded by a constant times uh, x to the one minus epsilon, right? Times um, log. Okay, so now, right, so what do we get from here? Maybe I should go right over there. Uh, okay, I don't know if I should erase. Okay, let me just, uh, maybe I'll go here. Yeah, I'll go here to not. Okay, so on one hand, is smaller or equal than pi x log x and bigger or equal than one minus epsilon log x pi x minus a term that's much smaller, right? Because it's a term that's of size uh, x to the one minus epsilon. Okay, so sometimes we, 
Okay, let me just, yeah, maybe I'll just do the C of X, where C of X is smaller or equal than, right, X to the one minus epsilon times log of X. Okay. And so, and so clearly, right, if this goes to X, then this term is, com is much, much smaller, so it matters nothing, right? So if V of X goes to X, then it must be that pi of x log x goes to x too, right? Because this holds for any epsilon, so I can take epsilon arbitrarily small. And this term is much, much smaller because it's of size x to the 1 minus epsilon. And so I prove what I want. Okay, so this really is a very simple, right? I mean, I wish the board was a bit bigger, but uh, really there's nothing to it. It's, is this, is this clear so far? Okay, so let's, let's organize here the board and then uh, we'll start with the actual, uh, yeah, with the actual uh, complex analysis. So let's rephrase uh, everything. Okay. Okay, so let me try to organize this so that then we start after. Yeah, it would be nice to have multiple boards that I can send up and down, but uh, we have to do what we can with what we have. I mean, so far I haven't done any analysis at all, right? We're just setting up. It's just elementary, I mean, I'm not even sure it should be called number theory, just elementary population. Okay, so, right, so let me, let's rephrase in the last four minutes exactly where we are and what we have. So prime number theorem says that pi x is, grows like x over log x, right? I defined this object, which was mu x equals the sum over p smaller than x, log p, right? And then we had a statement that we didn't prove, right? Which was what I call statement six. Right? Okay, still to prove. Okay, so we still need to prove that, okay? And what we showed is that, and that was easy, is that six implies the prime number theorem, right? This we showed and it was easy. And we also showed that, we also showed that pi of x was bounded by a constant by x over log x. So in particular, we have that if we take, if we take this function, then this is equal to, you know, again, the same thing, log p or equal than x. This is smaller or equal than if I just take, of course, we saw this, I have x log x. Okay. Right? Because I just replace the p by x. And we know that this is O of x. Right? Because we know that pi x is bounded by a constant. Uh, a constant times x over log x. So if you multiply log x, this is bounded by a constant times x. Okay, and so and so we have, and I think this had the number two. I somehow I, I made a mistake when I copied the numbers. So sorry that I have to go check. This was claim number three. All right. So claim number three, in the paper x is O of x. Okay. And so we've proven this. All we have to prove is that this function grows exactly as x. I mean, it's just as hard as a prime number theorem. And we already proved that it's bounded by a constant times x. Okay. And so now the way that the prime, uh, the way that, the way that complex analysis is going to show up, right, is through something called the Riemann zeta function. So 
this. So the way it will show up is to this function that you've seen in, uh, in exercise class. So here in, in this area of like analytic number theory and this stuff, it's normal to use the letter S, like to use the letter S for a complex number and to write S equals to sigma plus IT uh, for, uh, you know, with sigma and T being, um, being reals. So I'm gonna use that notation just because it's, it's the classical notation in this, uh, yeah, in this subfield. Okay, and so it turns out that this is a nice, uh, yeah, that this is a nice analytic uh, function, at least analytic in some places, right? We know clearly when S equals one, this is trouble, right? And so by analyzing this function, we're gonna be able to, by studying basically it's zeros, we'll be able to get the prime number theorem. And the amazing thing is getting better bounds on the prime number theorem would correspond to getting better understanding on the zeros of this function. And this is the celebrated Riemann hypothesis, like maybe the most important open problem in mathematics. Okay, and so I will try to convey, which, which I haven't at all yet, why is it that this has anything to do with that object over there? Why is it that it's gonna be able to count primes for us? And uh, what is the Riemann hypothesis and what would the Riemann hypothesis give us and what would it say about such function? Okay, so this is the plan for, I guess, the next three lectures. So today you saw no complex analysis except this, which I guess is a function that I defined on part at least of the complex plane. But you will see some complex analysis in what to come and I just wanted to set up the object so that, yeah, we don't have to do this next time. Okay, thanks so much and I'm happy to stick around if there's any questions.